my great pleasure to introduce our grand round speaker, Dr. Alana O'Reilly. She's the first in what I hope is going to be a long series of lecturers speaking on education, training, and career development. This was actually Barbara Bertness's idea. So Dr. O'Reilly hails to us from the Fox Chase Cancer Center, where she's an associate professor in the Molecular Therapeutics Program. She's the scientific director of the Immersion Science Program at Fox Chase. And she's also the executive director of the ECLOS Institute, which is a hub where students, teachers, and scientists all join forces to focus on critical biomedical problems, such as dietary effects of, um, on cancer. They're developing cutting edge projects and they're enhancing scientific leadership within the community in Philadelphia. Um, for, for these efforts, Dr. Riley recently received the Elizabeth W. Jones Award for Excellence in Education from the Genetic Society of America, among her many accolades. She received her PhD in cell and developmental biology at Harvard, and her research interests involve nutritional mechanisms that influence stem cell function and development. She's the recipient of multiple NIH awards for her research on stem cells and epithelial homeostasis. And today she's going to be talking to us both about her outreach and education and her own research in a talk that's entitled Kids Conquering Cancer, Flipping the Hierarchy to Find New Diet-Based Interventions for EGFR and HPV-Driven Cancers. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the platform over to Dr. O'Reilly. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, also, my very first research mentor, Anton Bennett, is one of your faculty members. And uh, everything I know, I learned from Anton <laughs> in Ben Neal's lab. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about mostly about our diet based programs um, involving high school students. So one of the things I want you all to start thinking about as we start here is why, why did you enter science. Um, a lot of times, you know, people ask us this question in all kinds of different applications and um, most of the answers are fairly similar, a little bit canned. I've loved science since childhood. I like to answer questions. Um, I have some aspect of love, love, love uh, for science here, or I care about somebody very much. Um, so one of the things that we want to do is to connect these puzzle pieces together to make an inclusive environment so that everyone can participate. So why do we even want inclusion? Why does it matter if we're all kind of similar people with similar ideas and we're going to work together better, right? Um, but, but that sort of limits our discoveries, right? So if we don't embrace the life experiences and knowledge of all different types of people, then we're essentially missing things that we could otherwise um, gather together. So why is inclusion so hard? Why is it so hard? Like we keep hearing about diversity, equity, inclusion efforts um, and failing and failing and failing. Why? Why is this so hard? So one of the really big problems we have, especially in a city like Philadelphia, which is 80% underrepresented minorities in science, um, is that we have a major attrition of scientists as they um, move up in the, in the scientific pipeline. So in terms of bachelor's degrees, it's still underrepresentation, but this number plummets by the time you get to um, postdocs, and then there has been exactly zero gains in full professors for underrepresented minorities in many decades. So what's the deal? Why is this happening? Um, one of the reasons is this why, the, the why that people who are minority um, scientists enter this field is to um, help address health challenges of their own communities. And so the topic choice in papers recently published by the NIH about their own grants um, shows that awards to African-American and black scientists are prohibitively low because of the topic choice of addressing the health disparities that plague their own communities. And this makes no sense, right? This makes no sense. We're recruiting people into science to address the problems that other people can address and then pushing them out by not allowing them to have funding. So these are both very excellent papers for anyone who is interested in this um, topic and wants to read more about it. So this lack of representation in science and medicine is a primary driver of health disparities. Um, just recently, if we highlight the COVID-19 pandemic, the um, underrepresentation in science is exactly reflected by the um, numbers of deaths of COVID-19 with black Americans having the highest rates of death and the lowest representation. 
This is the same across all chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, and, um, and also cancer. So here in Philadelphia, our demographics are flipped from the predominant demographics in science, where 70% uh, of US faculty research scientists are white. Um, in contrast, only 5% or fewer um, are African American or black. In the school district of Philadelphia, this is the opposite. So uh, our, our predominant populations are black and Hispanic. Um, and these students essentially have no chance of achieving a research career given the predominant prevailing culture. So this is something that we want to change. This, first of all, is not fair. And second of all, puts people in a situation of they don't even try to pursue science because they know they have no chance. Um, and our goal is to try to help Philadelphia address these health disparities in COVID-19, cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer's that are, are really um, destroying their communities. So how are we gonna do this? We already know that 77% of college students switch out of STEM majors after one semester. We created a program where 72% of our graduates actually continue conducting paid research in college, completely flipping these numbers. Fewer than 6% of Philadelphia and other inner city students complete their STEM degrees with fewer than 10% of those completing graduate degrees. In contrast, 100% of our students complete their STEM degrees on time. So how do we do this? This is a big change, right? A big change. Uh, so we created a, a program built on citizen science. Um, so a staircase of discovery is comprised of four steps, which level one is crowdsourcing. And many people have heard of apps where people can measure clouds and you know, say how many animals they saw in the woods near their house. Um, so it's sort of like, like an observation where the data gets transmitted back to scientists to interpret it. The second level is distributed intelligence. So this, the citizens can actually collect the data and start to think about what it means. Then participatory science where the students or participants um, define the problems, participate in the data collection. And then finally, where they're basically independent scientists like, like all of us. So we created a program that matches these steps, um, starting with students as young as fifth grade. So our primary um, participants are fifth to 12th grade. They start in school. They do their first research experience in school. Then they can um, continue focusing on a junk food diet, um, more in their classrooms, summer camps, an undergraduate bridge to research that's built on a graduate rotation, and finally independent research in um, Fox Chase Labs. And by the time they're ready to go to college, remember this is just before college, they already have up to two years of research experience under their belt and tend to get paid research positions their first year of college, and then they go up from there. So we started this program in 2013. This is Dara Reese Whelan. She's the science educator, curriculum guru, um, genius, who created, basically translates how we do advanced research into something that can be done in high school classrooms. Um, and since 2013, we've trained over 2000 students using this method. This is 570 of them on the steps of the Franklin Institute where they came to present their um, cancer research data in 2019 as a collective group, sharing with each other, with scientists, with the community, um, th their 18 new cancer gene hits of nutrients that affect cancer. Um, we're also collecting tons of education data points and 60% of these new scientists are um, underrepresented currently in biomedical research. So does it actually work? Do the students want to continue? Um, so th this is a kind of a complicated diagram, but just focus on the, the blues and the reds, which are the bad things, right? You don't see much blue and red in any of these pie charts, indicating that the students make tremendous gains in life skills, including peer collaboration, confidence, adjusting to projects and thinking outside the box that they can apply to any career. And keep in mind that these students are unselected. This is a bunch of ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders who are taking a class. Their teacher decided to participate in the program. They are not pre-selected or filled out an application saying they're interested in science. So this is actually a fairly, um, a, a, a fairly huge gain. Um, they also made gains in research skills how studying the topic addresses real world issues, which is something that's incredibly important given the COVID-19 pandemic and other issues. 
how to formulate a hypothesis, explain projects, um, and, and prepare and present their work. And then finally, the, the most important part perhaps is inclusion and interest, um, where students think and feel like a scientist. We have a little work to do on feeling like part of the scientific community um, to make sure that, that that number, that red bar goes down. Um, and then this was something that we never in a million years expected. We sort of expected maybe 20% would be interested in being a scientist, but 56% saying maybe was mind blowing, right? Think about all of the things these kids could be. And now just from this one little experience, they're thinking, maybe I wanna be a scientist. And even more, the numbers are even higher for students who wanna do more research, emphasizing the disconnect between what students think of as science and now what they know as research. So in 2019, we had over a thousand students in one run. Um, our biggest auditorium at Fox Chase only holds 320 people. So we created a um, nonprofit organization called the ECLOSE Institute, which is a hub where students, um, teachers, scientists, community, and hopefully we'll be building uh, accessible databases for everyone come together to try to solve these community health problems. So we have summer camps where students participate for a week, <laughs> um, really delving into high level techniques, including running gels, doing microscopy, lots of pipetting and um, measuring skills. And in, in the summer camps, again, more, even more students want to be scientists with nobody saying may, no, nobody said, no, I don't ever wanna be a scientist. And 90% of the students wanna do more research. And so one of the things I think we need to think about in general is how to infuse research into more other subjects because the students love doing the research, even those who don't necessarily wanna be scientists. So this is our undergraduate bridge to research. This is actually where we started in 2013 and we have 230 students who've now completed this program. Um, they have started to grow up now uh, since we started in 2013. We have 16% in medical school, an absolutely shocking 17.3% pursuing PhDs in biomedicine. Um, we have a number of them who are doing gap years in research labs, 22%. 18% are engineers and 6% are in other STEM related careers, especially business, entrepreneurship, um, math type stuff. So yeah, so since this has been working so well, we expanded this to be true community science, having an out, outreach um, citizen science event in the fall where we had church members and kids and families, oh, that's all blurry, um, all participating in providing their thoughts, their ideas, and their um, input in how to solve the problem of diabetes in, in the Philadelphia community. So how does this all work? Like, why is this working better than other things? And the, the key thing is the why. So this is a, um, this is a, a video of one of our presenters that emphasizes the importance of the why. So coming into this project, I was most interested in studying squamous cell carcinoma, which is a type of skin cancer that affects over a million people in the US every year. One of those people was my grandmother who I lost to the disease in 2015. You might notice a small blue butterfly floating around for my presentation. That's my Zami, she'll be joining us today. <laughs> so one of the most important things for our students is that they are here to cure somebody they love. And so one of the things I think we lose sight of as scientists in our training is, is that why. So we come in, oh yeah, that's great that you came in because your, your Zami is sick, um, but here's how we do things here. Here's the project I'm giving you. And so this is something I want everybody here to really start thinking about is, do you know what the why is for all of your trainees? Does it matter, right? Is that why they're still here? Is that what's driving them to succeed in a very difficult, um, particularly funding environment? And is that something that, that can be leveraged to identify new um, ways to treat, uh, you know, treat and prevent cancer or other diseases? So diet is a particularly accessible topic for children. Um, everybody knows what's good to eat, what's bad to eat. Um, children in particular have body image um, challenges and then many people in their families also have more advanced diseases like diabetes and cancer that they want to understand and help. So we start with the question of what should I eat? 
Our main goal is to improve research literacy so that students understand what research is, how it's conducted, what the vocabulary is, what's expected of them, um, and including the, the existing hierarchy. So the, um, the program is student-centered, it's transdisciplinary, um, it promotes self-efficacy of each and every student, and it improves the agency of the instructors and the students to take charge of their own research questions and projects. So why diet? Why does diet matter? Um, you know, my, my research lab works on how nutrients impact signal transduction pathways, which is the um, core of how we started in, in this area for this large uh, scale outreach program. And diet is unambiguously a key to health. So this is a current sort of diagram of the recommendations for a healthy diet where you have lots of fruits and vegetables, probably too many grains, um, a small amount of, of meat and protein products and some dairy with a very tiny little pie slice of junk food here. And I think most people don't really eat this. Um, most people, it's a little bit expanded down here on this end and reduced a lot here on this end. But this type of healthy diet is known to reduce the symptoms of aging and to promote healthy aging throughout the lifetime. So we all know, right? We all know what we should be eating, but we don't always do that. So what do we do? How do, how do we make this better? There's diets, um, dietary cookbooks that are about longevity, um, reducing calories, um, eat less, live longer. And this, these diets are actually very, very well supported by basic science data showing that in every organism, um, caloric restriction extends lifespan and improves health. Um, most recently, intermittent feeding um, is, is another probably much easier way to um, reduce the, the metabolism challenges that occur during unhealthy aging uh, in a similar way to caloric restriction. And so, so how do we leverage these types of diets? Is intermittent feeding a good thing for, for a young teenager with a body image issue? Probably not. So how do we start to have the conversations? How do we promote um, health through diet? And how do we leverage chemicals in the diet to try to improve um, existing therapies. So another really cool thing about diet is it's very cultural. So every religion has very specific um, dietary um, recommendations. There's herbal medicine that is widely used in almost all areas of the world. And then just think about where you're from, right? So there's some kind of a cultural cuisine um, where you're from that is something that's to be celebrated in holidays and all of these things. So why not celebrate those same things to promote health? So in the United States, a lot of people do the um, herbal medicine type thing using dietary supplements. And just as a, as, as a thing to note, dietary supplements are not regulated by the FDA. The FDA is not authorized to review dietary supplement products before they are marketed. And so we are relying completely on manufacturers and distributors to make sure the products are safe before they go to market. So no dietary supplements are regulated by the government. 70% of cancer patients are using dietary supplements compared to 56.6% of the general population. This is an extraordinarily high number. Um, these studies were done on predominantly white patients um, with very few, I couldn't actually find any studies that were done exclusively on minority patients. Um, the one study I did find said that 76.3% of Hispanic patients do not tell their doctor that they're taking the supplements, which I think is true for most um, people. So this is something that's also important to consider is that people are taking stuff that might be um, interrupting the, the therapy that they're being prescribed. So what's our goal? Our goal is to understand how every chemical that you can consume as part of a diet impacts signal transduction pathways that are involved in disease. So this is a proteome um, diagram from Drosophila. So the entire Drosophila genome um, translated into proteins with interaction maps here. So what we would like to do is take each and every compound that's found in the diet and identify those that inhibit or activate individual proteins to create a new diet map on top of the proteome map so that we can create um, tailored diets for individual diseases based on the genetics, the protein expression, um, and the, the dietary access of the patient. So that's obviously an extremely daunting task. Like it's something where our usual 
one protein, one project, one mechanism, one person um, is not going to work. And so this is one of the reasons that we think that um, getting high school students involved, which is a population that's eager and in desperate need of having these types of experiences. We have 16 million high school students in the United States with 50, 550 million worldwide. So suddenly a daunting task maybe becomes a little bit more feasible. Each of these students comes from a family that eats, right? They have their own particular types of cuisine that are important to them, some of which may have chemical compounds that can inhibit um, cancer signaling pathways to enhance the efficacy of existing therapies. So how do we do this? We have a bunch of dietary supplements um, or other things that the students bring in. Uh, we feed them to fruit flies, either wild type fruit flies or flies bearing mutations in oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, or more recently in um, pathways related to diabetes. And then we screen to see what happens to the developmental life cycle of the fly. So do they continue to lay eggs? Do they develop into pupae? Um, and then do they close as adults? And so what we found is the most reproducible assay is counting the, um, the number of pupae on the side of the vial. So you can see here, these are like the little larvae and then they crawl up and become um, pupa like a chrysalis for a butterfly. Um, and if we have hundreds of people scoring the same exact sample, we actually get pretty tight, um, pretty tight statistics for um, determining the, the numbers of pupae. And so you can clearly see that wild type can be compared to loss of function mutants in P10, which are fairly similar to gain of function um, mutants in PI3 kinase, which are in the same um, related pathway. Things like the FOXO mutants have much more uh, broad variability. So it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to interpret the results of those experiments. So this type of experiment can be done with any gene that anybody's interested in for which there is a mutant uh, um, in the fly model. So we focus with the students initially on basics. So signal transduction, you have a ligand, you have a receptor, you have an effector, you drive proliferation, that causes cancer, keep it simple. In a cancer pathway, you could have too much ligand that drives the whole pathway. You can mutate the receptor or you can have a mutant effector, all of which will give the same outcome of having um, too much proliferation. So we, since 2013, we've had a big project on the EGF receptor pathway and all of the genes that you see here, we have representative um, viable mutations in flies, which are modifiable, meaning if a uh, compound makes the phenotype worse, that will be detected. If the compound makes the phenotype better, that will be detected because these are mutants that are not complete nulls. Um, so the, the great thing about this is that many high schools have eight groups of students who are doing experiments together. So we give them sequential mutants in the EGF receptor signaling pathway, have them screen the same drugs, and in doing so, we can map exactly which of the um, components of the signaling pathway are affected. So in order to prove the proof of principle for this, um, we started by treating flies with gefitinib, which is an inhibitor of the EGF receptor. And what happens is the same thing that happens if you have a loss of function EGF receptor mutant, which is you fuse these uh, respiratory structures called dorsal appendages on the egg. So in a wild type, there are two, and in a, in a gefitinib treated or an EGF receptor mutant, there's only one. So this is a very robust, easy to score phenotype for anybody, just even using a magnifying glass. Um, and then we screened a bunch of different uh, kinase inhibitors and the ones in red are known EGF receptor inhibitors. And you can see that all of them had some effect on uh, induction of dorsal appendage uh, fusion. There were a couple others, um, imatinib, which inhibits able kinase and mesitinib, which inhibits VEGF receptor um, also had, had effects, which is something we'll follow up at some time later. Um, we also noticed that at a low dose of gefitinib, you have the dorsal appendage defects, but normal numbers of eggs. If you increase the dose, now you reduce the numbers of eggs, which turns out to be a much more easy and robust to score phenotype, which is loss of development. And then finally, there's excellent reagents for measuring downstream signaling, um, including ERK activity. So here is no gefitinib. You see nice ERK activity. And as soon as you start adding the gefitinib, you, um, you inhibit the, the ERK downstream of the EGF receptor. 
And, you know, these are like the students learn how to do this and they do it once. And so you get some variability in the loading. But at the end of the day, what we're looking for is something to pursue um, in a professional lab um, down the road. So once the students started screening the dietary supplements, the first thing that popped out was selenomethionine, which gives an EGF receptor-like phenotype of a single dorsal appendage. Um, you also see dramatically reduced um, numbers of pu pupil cases, meaning that the selenomethionine is behaving like a high dose of gefitinib in a sense of reducing the numbers of eggs laid. So in order to figure out if this was real, so one student doesn't mean it's right, they could have killed everything, right? Like you, you just don't know. Um, so we put this into a classroom project for this 570 students I showed you on the steps of the Franklin Institute, and they screened all of the um, steps in the EGF receptor signaling pathway um, mutants in all of these different steps for uh, effects by selenium. And what we see is that the high dose of selenomethionine basically affects everybody, meaning it's probably toxic for any fly. Um, but the low dose was actually quite variable, such that only RAS and corkscrew, which is the fly homologue of the tyrosine phosphatase SHP2, were the only two affected. Um, and they were affected in opposite ways, such that the RAS mutants were less viable and the corkscrew mutants were more viable um, upon treatment with selenomethionine. So then we use the ERK activation. Again, here's wild type. This is the activated EGF receptor mutant. You see a dramatic increase. We can also do this by immunostaining to see specifically which cells are affected by various treatments. And what we found here is that the, um, which was a surprise, we expected the selenomethionine to reduce the um, ERK activity. Instead, if you compare the wild type here in lane one, to this lane over here, the selenomethionine actually blasted the ERK signaling, um, bypassing any type of inhibition of the EGF receptor. So this turned out to be true in multiple different cancer cells, which the students went on to do in box chase labs in the summer. Um, so breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and pancreatic cancer with gain of function RAS mutations all showed the similar effect with selenomethionine actually increasing ERK activity up until, um, at least in two cases, the dose got too high. Um, KCO2, which is a non-RAS dependent colorectal cancer cell line, had less of an effect, um, suggesting that, like in the fly, the gain of function RAS mutations um, make the, the cells more sensitive to this um, selenomethionine effect. So we've done this with it. We're still in the process of finish, finishing this um, project. Um, over 300 students have worked on it in addition to the 1,001 students who did the screening in the classrooms. So it's gonna be a lot of authors <laughs> on the paper that we're planning to publish this year. Um, but we have a number of other compounds that inhibit specific components of this pathway. So burdock root is a very um, potent inhibitor in this case of AKT. Um, butcher's broom, is an activator of corkscrew, as is selenomethionine, and um, grapeseed extract inhibits RAF. So, so this is something where you can see, like, eventually we will kind of have a, a really nice map of this particular pathway and the different compounds that, um, that can affect it. So this was a project that I designed thinking it's accessible, it's easy, it's straightforward, it's part of the curriculum um, for the students what they need to learn in high school. And then we started having students come in with their own ideas. Um, so one student brought in apricot seeds, which his mom, who was a breast cancer survivor, was taking as um, God's cure for cancer. It turns out as soon as you digest this, it turns into a molecule of cyanide and a molecule of benzaldehyde. And women who are taking this are dying of cyanide poisoning. Um, so this is a really serious public health issue that nobody reports to their doctor because as soon as you tell your doctor I'm taking apricot seeds, they say you can die <laughs> from cyanide poisoning. Um, so, so this is something that's essentially people taking poison that needs to be addressed. Um, another student came in saying that her grandfather had stage four lung cancer and was eating 100 live weevils in a glass of Sprite every day and it cured his stage four lung cancer. And so this is you know, another curiosity, like you don't just tell people you shouldn't do that, like we need to figure this out. And it turns out what she found out was that the defense chemicals secreted by these weevils when they get dropped into a glass of Sprite are actually very potent chemotherapeutics against lung cancer. 
Um, so, so this is something where there's truth and there's danger in, in the same thing. And these are not things that most scientists would be like, oh, let's go investigate weevils. Um, so, so these are things that are happening in our communities that we don't know about and are extremely important. And finally, just last summer, we had a kid come in who was interested in lean, which is a combination of codeine-based cough syrup and Sprite. And kids are using this to get high. Um, and he was very concerned that his friends who were all doing this because it's healthier than taking drugs um, were gonna get brain cancer. And so these are the sorts of things that are going on that the students want to research because it's affecting the people they love. And we don't wanna bring them in and tell them that's not important because this is important. <laughs> so this is a project that I'll, I'll just highlight a lot, which is a, a project designed by five young ladies, starting with Ileana here, who was doing a cultural awareness project to find out what cancers particularly affect uh, people from Puerto Rico. And so what she found is that Puerto Ricans have an extremely high rate of HPV-based cervical cancer, even though um, Hispanic girls were more like to get vaccinated than white girls. And so this was something that was really bothering her. So most of the studies have been done on HPV types 16 and 18. So here's 8,100 um, cases of this. But it turns out that in Hispanic and black communities, uh, other strains of HPV are more prevalent. And so um, these are not small numbers. So 1,800 from these types and then another 1,200 from these types is, is not a small number. And it turns out that many of these um, strains of the virus are not actually protected by available vaccines. So, so this started a conversation among these predominantly minority women of what's going on with this. So there's a lot of um, you know, so, sort of social reasons for, for pointing fingers at why um, health disparities exist. So a lot of it has to do with poverty, uh, access to healthcare, and various life choices that are generally considered explanations for why these health disparities exist. But Ileana's discovery sort of made it seem like maybe there's some genetic basis to some of these differences. So Nicole Harrington came in with this concept that um, black mothers don't trust the medical community enough to get vaccinated. And so this is an example for the COVID-19 vaccine, where you can see that black Americans had a very, very low uh, vaccination rate compared to um, white Americans. And similarly, for the HPV vaccine, um, the same thing is true, where um, Hispanic and, and black Americans are less likely to get vaccinated. And then what we also need to really realize is that um, they, they think the vaccine is harmful. And even more that, um, you know, they think people are being treated like guinea pigs <laughs> by scientists like us. So, so this is a really big issue in terms of how to get information out, how to reduce this mistrust. And our take on this is that we need to in increase representation and understanding of the fears that the public has um, about these vaccines. So then we went down to the cellular molecular level. Um, so HPV happens with a initial infection. The, um, the virus can move into sort of the, the basic sort of um, stem cell areas of the, of the cervix and then it can just hang out for a while and then eventually it can come out um, and create invasive neoplasia. And so this is a pathway that's, um, that's basically mediated by inhibition of P53 and RB, um, which are two proteins that control the cell cycle. Um, and so two students, Nylis and Allison, decided to screen dietary supplements to find something that would kill flies bearing mutations in P53 or RB to sort of mimic um, virus infection. And what they found was multiple components that drive a process called ferroptosis, which is a type of iron dependent cell death. And you can see here that uh, the P53 null flies are highly susceptible to acetaminophen, which is Tylenol um, or iron in terms of being killed. And then they went on and did a dose curve to find doses that really had little or no effect on wild type, but still um, were, were potent for RB and P53 mutants. And so we're very interested in this kind of idea that they came up with from their own experiences. And it turns out that HPV inhibits a receptor that is a major controller of, um, of ferroptosis through 
a protein called GPX4. P53 is also a regulator of this process. Um, acetaminophen, which is um, one of the things that's scored in the screen, actually affects this whole process. And so a colleague of mine, Jeff Peterson, who's also at Fox Chase, is a lab that studies ferroptosis. Um, and so they had two compounds, ESA and Arastin, that act in different ways to induce ferroptosis. Um, and so we wanted to see whether the observations that the students made in the fly would be true also in HPV dependent cancer cells. So this was done by Jesse Reinach with the help of uh, postdoc in Jeff's lab, Tanu Singh. Um, and what we see is differential uh, sensitivity to the uh, ESA compound such that in cervical cancer cells, the HPV positive um, cells are resistant to induction of ferroptosis. And in the head and neck cancer cells, they're actually more sensitive. And so this is something that we're trying to uh, figure out now, like what is the difference between these? And obviously the cells have more things going on in them other than just HPV infection. Um, but we know that this was actually ferroptosis uh, process because if you add an inhibitor of ferroptosis, then you um, abrogated the, the response. So using a different uh, inducer of ferroptosis called Arastin, um, there didn't seem to be any effect at all on HPV minus um, head and neck cancer cells, but there really was a dose dependent um, reduction, uh, increase in killing basically of the HPV positive cells that Jesse is going to be further exploring this summer. So uh, the two projects together may be actually um, centered on, on one particular thing, which is selenium, um, which is an activator of GPX4. GPX4 is a selenium dependent um, protein that prevents the production of lipid radicals, which are what causes this ferroptosis. Um, and at the same time, we found that if we reduced seleno, um, if we increase selenomethionine in the EGF receptor pathway, we drive activity of ERK, which we know I, did, I didn't show, but it's through corkscrew SHP2, which happens to also be a, a tyrosine phosphatase that's regulated by these lipid radicals. And so one of the things that's kind of coming out just from this initial one single compound that we focused on is maybe there's a vulnerability in, um, in, in these, the head and neck cancer cells for, for a dependence on selenium, such that if a restriction diet um, that reduces the levels of selenium is used in conjunction with existing therapies, maybe they'll work better. So all of this is to say that the why really matters for the students and the way our, our scientific culture is set up right now, we have a very high level principal investigator. Um, it goes down, 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 depending on the level of training such that high school students are gifted with science. And what we would like to do is change that so that the high school students come in with the science they already have, that we figure out what those projects, those questions, those hypotheses are, and match them to a scientist who is also interested in the same thing. And so, so that it comes in more as a, you know, a peer kind of um, attack on the same problem. And so one of the things I really want to say is that the culture matters. And so this is a, an image of a boardroom from Time Magazine. Uh, from a little while ago where you can see the top guys are, are all up here um, talking down here to the diversity equity inclusion officers who are supposed to be the ones who are focused on changing the culture, but instead they're being lectured on this is our culture. And so one of the things um, that's really important is to consider whether this is your lab meeting, right? If this is your lab meeting and you're not considering the ideas of the people down here at this end of the table, then that's something that's really um, time to change. Finally, um, one of the things that's really our job if we take underrepresented students into our lab is to ensure their safety. You need to be the shield against the um, systemic racism that's coming at them from every direction, every minute of every day so that they can run behind you in a way that they can thrive and bring these new ideas into um, biomedicine. And finally, like I just want to share my own experience that the way these students think has completely changed the way I think about an important scientific question, such that the biology, the environment, and the lifestyle all have to be considered so that we can really address um, particularly health disparities um, in cancer and other diseases. So I just want to leave you with, with our group, our crew from 2019. Remember their faces. This is the future of cancer research. Isabella here on the uh, right side 
is just got accepted to a Yale summer program and she's considering that and I think 14 other <laughs> other programs so so we'll see uh, whether she comes. So we've had a bunch of funding a lots of lots of support. Uh, we're particularly excited about a recent partnership with the American Cancer Society for the eclose programs um, to support 300 young ladies doing cancer research this summer. Um, and the team is amazing. I already mentioned Dara. I have my lab who's, who supports all the students summer learning um, and a whole bunch of Fox Chase mentors. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alana. I'd like to ask folks to put questions into the chat. And if you, I, I can start off with one. Um, if that's okay with you, then maybe Barbara oh, sure. I'm sure has questions. So first of that was that was a fascinating presentation and a real tour de force. So congratulations. Oh, a lot that. of questions about the nuts and bolts. So how do you fund this? How do you channel hundreds of high school students into 20 labs at best at Fox Chase? How right. do you make so all of we, that happen? We don't, we can't, right? You can't mm -hmm. do that. You can't have 2,000. I mean, we're we're actually hoping to reach 10,000 students a year by next year, um, and there's no way that we can put each and every one of those students into a lab. It's just not possible. And so that's what we're trying to flip. So when COVID-19 happened, it became unambiguous that students couldn't come to the lab. And so what we did was we created a hybrid program where we create labs in a box and we mail them to the students who create the lab in their house. And so um, because fruit flies are safe, the dietary supplements are over the counter, everything that they research is over the counter. That doesn't mean it's safe, but that just means <laughs> it's legal um, for them to investigate. Um, and so they, they do all of the research in their homes. And so all of the initial, um, initial data collection and analysis is, is done in a way where we don't actually need any space. So we also train teachers. Um, we have, I think, 32 now teacher partners, each training about 100 students a year. Um, and so the teachers, now we just, oh, I, we got an award that I don't think I'm allowed to say what it is, but it's really big and exciting. Um, that's going to pay for building of eclose labs in 10 Philadelphia schools. Um, this year. And so now the schools will each have a fully equipped lab, just like the eclose lab for the students to do the work there. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so, and then the other thing we did was make it very inexpensive. So dietary supplements don't cost very much and flies cost almost nothing. Um, and so the um, cost for, for each participant, once they have the lab set up is only $15 a kid. Um, so, so far we've been able to, to do that. The primary driver of the revenue right now and the fundraising is that universities are sponsoring these programs. Um, everybody sort of wants <laughs> well-trained, underrepresented students to come to their school. And so they are paying for us to run the programs for them, which is, I mean, how could it get better, right? As a partnership, like, like we help you get your students ready and, and you can get the funding. So. Um, so that's how it's been so far, but yeah, funding is always, you know. <laughs> and then the, so, so most of those Western bots being done in the eclose lab, and I presume that's a physical lab inside Fox Chase. No, so the Western blots are done by the students who stay in the summer for the independent research, they get matched into the labs. Um, we, we have too many Westerns to do for that to remain feasible. And so last summer we developed a dot blot protocol, which I, should have put in, they were a little ugly and they weren't related to the projects I was talking about, like, um, but, but it works. So, so you can do um, ERC, ERC dot blots that give you the same answer that you get on a Western and you can do them just by pipetting onto a membrane um, in, a, in a high school classroom. And so, so that's what we're sort of doing is trying to figure out how to kind of, actually we could call it kicking it old school. Like how, how do we do things before we could do all these fancy things? Um, and then we're bringing those back with the idea that the professional labs will then confirm confirm the results. Uh, yep. So um, Alana, uh, amazing work and um, to, to touch so many lives, it's, it's just uh, very inspirational. Um, it's sort of like the, the why question, but if you could take us back to when you started this, um, how did you, get the Philadelphia Public Schools to let you in? And um, were there particular challenges in the beginning that that um, 
if you knew now what you if you knew then what you knew now you would have structured it a little differently in the beginning or um how did it how did it get off the ground to the scale yeah so it it didn't right we we started with 15 students our initial intention was eight um because one of the reasons i went to fox chase was because they had a high school program i participated in a program called project success when i was a grad student at harvard and in, in ben nils lab um and my student was so extraordinarily smart and so extraordinarily unprepared um and so we spent the whole summer doing a lot of stuff it, it just became very clear that if a student like her instead of getting dropped into a lab like ben's lab um had had a training experience ahead of time so that she would know how to measure like know what a gram was um that it would be much different so i knew that that ex she's now a chief attending at um chop in philadelphia so extraordinary success um and and i know her and she has two little kids and it's amazing um but but it transformed me a lot more than it did her like like this is something where i can put this tiny little bit of effort into this and it can change somebody's whole family's life so um i knew that if i ever got a faculty job i would want to create a training program ahead of time so our first year we we trained 15 students most of them were not actually underrepresented from philadelphia um it took us a couple of years to figure out that Philly students weren't applying because they didn't think they could compete with suburban kids. Uh, so we created a Philadelphia only section and since then it's just been exploding. Um, and then it's actually Dara who got into the Philly school system by her connections with teachers. So she was a teacher in the Philadelphia school system before she was a community college professor. Um, and so she just used those connections and we started getting in. We're not actually throughout the Philadelphia school system yet. We still partner with individual teachers. Um, the inner city schools are so oppressive to try to get into and they don't have any money to pay for STEM. So um, so we've just accepted that that's our responsibility. And <laughs> yeah, so now people at eClose are writing these grants to, um, to, to make sure that our Philly students are our highest priority. Elena, can you tell us a little more about eClose? How big is it? How many people work there? How do they relate to Fox Chase? So eClose is separate um, from Fox Chase. It's a separate nonprofit. Um, Fox Chase, like I said, is pretty small. And so to run a nationwide program with tens of thousands of students a year is not something that's that's within that capacity. Um, so, so we created it as a separate nonprofit. Um, almost our third year anniversary is coming up. Um, we have 21 employees. All of them are part time. Um, a third of them are instructors. A third of them are scientific technicians who build the kits um, and and set up some of the experiments, depending on what the program is. Um, and then the the rest are. You know, I'm a volunteer, so <laughs> I'm just a total volunteer. Um, yeah, so it's a uh, we're in 14 US states now we have uh, 11 university sponsors, including seven comprehensive cancer centers, um, the American Cancer Society is sponsoring that huge program, and we have programs ranging all the way from fifth grade through through um, adults interested in transitioning into biomedical careers. So it's a it's a very rapidly, <laughs> rapidly growing thing. And I think the COVID pandemic, when nobody could actually do any science was you know, all of a sudden they're like, wait, I heard about these people who started this thing. So I'm in the eClose lab now. It's 500 square feet and it's, um, you know, we'll, we'll grow as we grow. There's a question from the audience, from Dr. Rose. Uh, so are these other resources to help these young people get into college, pay for college? And do you find these issues are barriers? So we don't have those resources. Um, like I said, we don't actually even have full time employees yet. Um, that that's that's something that um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that we will get there because most of our students end up getting full ride scholarships. So our biggest sending schools at this point are University of Pennsylvania, which has hosted 32 of our senior level um, students, and I don't think any of them has paid. Um, and our second biggest sending school now is MIT. Um, we also have a lot of students at Pitt and Drexel and Temple. Um, and I don't think any single one of our students who've gone to Temple has not been a science scholar, which is full four year scholarship with room and board, the whole, the whole nine yards. And so I think the unusual 
um, nature of having this kind of research experience, a personal statement that's talking about how discussing your personal why, the person that you did this for and how you are gonna bring together all of the interests that you gained from this program into creating a project that's gonna be transformative is pretty, <laughs> it's pretty well received by, by colleges and universities so far. So, um, so that may be something where if there's another nonprofit that's doing that, like providing scholarships and things, we would love to partner. Like I said, eClose is a hub. We want to kind of drop down the barriers of competition. So we don't really, you know, I've had a lot of people in Flyland say, oh, we'll just replicate your program. Like, that's great. But now we're, your data is going to be over there. Our data is, what's the point? Like, why don't we do this together? So, so that's one of the main things we're working on this year is how to collect the data so that if somebody does replicate the program just on their own, how is it that they can contribute to the database so that all of us can you know, use this kind of screening data for, for advancement of science? And one of the things that struck me in your talk was that you said multiple times, the students decided to do this, that or the other, the student was interested in this question. Um, so essentially, none of us gets to really choose what we decide to do in science all the time. You have to have funding. It has to be practical and feasible and so on. So when a student um, sh uh, shows interest in something, how do you channel them to a lab that might actually have the expertise, um, seeing that you don't have endless labs at Fox Chase? Right. So this, this is our, that, that's like our newest, newest thing. So the first... Um, four years maybe five years of the program was really just my thing like let's do egf receptor because you know we had to figure out how to do it all um does the data even mean anything like thank heavens the pupil counting is really 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 significant and important um so so we spent those five years just doing my thing so in 2017 we started getting kids bringing in bags of like my mom's eating this um and then that's when that started to change and so it's really only in the past two years where we're trying to um, bring together fox chase faculty who do specific things so we have a um, beha social behavioral researcher carolyn fang who's extremely interested in medical mistrust who was more than happy to host nicole in doing this this project that she's doing and then together we got this small foundation grant for five more students to continue that work so carolyn will um, you know, support them in developing educational interventions specifically designed for the communities of the participating five members of that of that research group. And then Jeff just happened to work on ferroptosis and we landed on iron and acetaminophen, right? So, so, so far it's like coming together. Last summer we had seven students, everyone from a different cultural background who all were interested in BRCA driven breast cancer. All of them had a family member. We have another group that's interested in um, beta thalassemias. So a number of different, again, cultural groups that were interested in that. And so, right, this is why, why the concept of eClose is going to become more and more and more important, especially with university sponsors, because where am I going to send the kids? I, I'm already way overwhelmed, like, oh my gosh, I can't think about all of these projects all at the same time. Um, and so that's what we sort of need. And so we're kind of thinking about creating like a, a fast pitch competition that's a video based thing where every student would like hold up their phone and go, oh, and this is the project I'm really excited about. And then the scientists would just go through, you know, no more than 30 seconds to a minute pitch and say, that student is interested in what I'm interested in. So do you see what I mean? Like, we're hoping to kind of like change it so that the students actually can go into a lab that celebrates their interests. Um, we also, I forgot to say, we have a partnership with Penn Medicine that takes a number of our students each year and they have, they're much bigger. So yeah. they, they have more um, capacity. Wow, that's an amazing undertaking, the whole thing. What, what percent of your time do you spend on this? Just one last question, unless Barbara- I'm officially it. allowed to spend one day a week. <laughs> that's what I spend. <laughs> okay, we won't quote you on that. Yeah. <laughs> Barb? Any closing comments? Uh, you know, I, I just want to say again that the the creativity and the um, the way you've leveraged what started out as small experiences to to extend to so many people and and also you know so I know that at Yale um, over fifty percent of our um, 
first generation and underrepresented undergraduates when they show up as first years um, say that they want to major in STEM. And uh, the attrition is, as you said, over 70% of, of them don't end up graduating in a, in a STEM um, uh, program or, or major. So the, you know, the fact that you are seeing 100% retention in STEM and that uh, your medical school PhD balance, because you know, we're also aware that minority communities are more familiar with the physician as a role model than the scientist. Um, I think th those just, th they set a very high bar for everybody else who works in this space. It's amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we could just help you. Like that, that's one of the things that we, I actually met um, Tony Koleski at this uh, HHMI professors competition that we, we were both finalists there. And the, the, the goal be behind that was to create undergraduate a first year undergraduate semester of doing this, like doing the program that we designed. And so that students wouldn't go into that weed out class because every school has a weed out class, which I cannot comprehend, right? Well, at Temple, that, right? at Temple the which was the partner, they say yeah. we, we give them chemistry, we fail 70% of the students. And this is like a, we did a good job, we failed 70% out. And so why would you recruit students who are already vulnerable, not based on their own fault, but because of the challenges of an inner city public education and then fail them out? Like that's basically, you know, it, it's it's so unfair. It's basically taking any little tiny step on the rug that you had and yanking it right out. Yep. So, so that's what we would be dreaming of having in the future is to be able to work with each and every school to say what's the most important research that you're doing how do we create interdisciplinary groups to you know have a student who's interested in public health together with a student who's interested in chemistry biology do you see what i mean to to basically create those kind of program project groups from students at the as their very first research experience that's what we really want to do it's amazing thank you so much that was Amazing, incredibly inspiring. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. If you have questions, you can find me, Alana Fox Chase. <laughs> <laughs> okay.